Hello, I'm Annette Young and welcome to the 51% show about women reshaping our world. Coming up, how women in some of the most conservative countries in the Middle East are challenging religious norms with a growing group in Saudi Arabia refusing to wear the abaya. Also in Iran, Saudi's arch foe, there's been a public outcry following the death of a female football fan who set herself alight after being arrested. And are we going to have to rely on young girls to get the message out there? We meet Thailand's answer to Greta Thunberg, 12-year-old Lily, who's becoming the country's best-known environmental activist. But we begin in Saudi Arabia, where in a bid to secure greater social freedom, some women have decided to do away with the obligatory abaya. The long-flowing overgarment, often black, is traditional wear for women in the conservative Muslim kingdom. However, a growing number are taking to leaving the abaya at home altogether. A fashion statement that goes beyond clothes. At this mall in central Riyadh, Mashael Al Jaloud is turning heads with her outfit, a Western-style ensemble that's not covered up by a traditional abaya. It's a rare spectacle that flies in the face of Sharia law, which requires women to hide their hair and bodies in the name of chastity and morality. Mashael knows that she's taking a risk by dressing this way. There are no clear laws, no protection. I might be at risk or be subjected to assault from some religious extremists because I'm walking without an abaya. But the man who emboldened her to do so was none other than the kingdom's de facto ruler. As part of his drive to liberalize the ultra-conservative kingdom, Mohammed bin Salman last March said that women in Saudi Arabia didn't need to wear abayas and that they weren't mandatory in Islam. But since no formal changes followed his announcement, many continued to wear the garment. Mashael says one fully veiled woman had already threatened to report her to the police. Meanwhile, onlookers in the Saudi capital are divided. Of course they'll agree with her walking around about an abaya. It's strange. It's normal and not surprising. The abaya is not something mandatory or official, and neither is the hijab. It's only embedded in tradition, which hopefully will not exist anymore. Mashael isn't the only one. 25-year-old Manahel al Otaibi has also abandoned the abaya. I'm not trying to prove anything. I just want to live the way that I want to, act freely without restrictions, not be forced to wear something that I don't want to wear. That's the whole point. Although hardliners have denounced them as publicity seekers deserving of punishment, the trend underscores a bold push for social liberties by young Saudis, one that may outstrip the monarchy's capacity for change. They may be arch enemies, but one thing Iran and Saudi Arabia share in common is both being loudly criticised for their treatment of women. Recently, an Iranian female football fan was reportedly detained when she tried to get into the stadium dressed as a man. After she was arrested, she set herself alight and died. As a result, celebrities and activists are now urging FIFA to ban Iran from competitions. Her face covered in bandages, appeared on her favorite football club's Twitter page. Sahar set herself on fire in front of a Tehran court in early September, after learning she could face a two-year prison sentence. Her crime, attempting to enter a football stadium dressed as a man to watch her team play. The young football fan later died from her injuries. Following the incident, thousands have expressed outrage over a persisting stadium entry ban for women in Iran. They don't let us inside the stadium, but here inside a shopping center, there's no problem. When we come here, we can yell, we can scream, and we can release energy. I believe this type of outlet helps reduce violence in society. Iran has barred women spectators at football games since the 1979 Islamic Revolution arguing that they must be protected from the masculine atmosphere and the sight of semi-clad men. I think football fields aren't proper places for women. I don't agree that women should be allowed in stadiums. I think it's wrong. It'll just cause more problems in the stadium and also on our streets and neighborhoods. 
FIFA, the world football governing body, has failed to compel Iran to allow women into stadiums, despite years-long efforts. But following national and international reaction to Sahar's tragic story, the Iranian government has announced it would review the situation. We believe that women should be allowed to enter a stadium. But I'm sure you understand that some are worried about their presence there. Our next game is against Cambodia, and women will be present, and their presence will increase progressively. In recent past, Tehran has allowed a few women to watch games in public, mostly to alleviate pressure from FIFA. But some human rights bodies view this as a ploy to manipulate the chief soccer federation, doubting the Iranian government's intention to make meaningful changes. Now, in recent years, thousands of Nigerians, a third being women, have attempted to flee to Europe in the hope of a better life. But many find themselves going no further than Libya, where they are sold into slavery. A number of them have been repatriated to Nigeria and in some cases heading back with children born as a result of rape. And it's far from being a happy return home, as this report reveals. Learning new skills in an adult education centre, Joy is trying to restore some normality to her life. She may be just 20 years old, but she has already been through a lifetime of trauma. She once dreamed of making it to Europe from Nigeria, a dream that was crushed in her passage through Libya, where she was held in a detention center and raped by one of the guards. Joy was 17 when she gave birth. Sometimes people think I'm a nanny. They don't believe I give birth to her. So I just have to tell them that I'm the mom. They will ask me how come. So I don't want to tell them the story. When they ask me where is the father, I'll say, I can just say the father is in Dubai or somewhere else like that. Joy managed to escape and returned to Nigeria voluntarily with the help of the International Organization for Migration. She is one of over 14,000 Nigerians who have returned home from Libya under the NGO scheme since 2017. Around a third of those are women, and in some cases, they travel back home with children born of rape. Faith has a similar story, falling pregnant after being sold into sexual slavery by human traffickers in Libya. So even when my smoke was up like this, even when I was heavily pregnant, he would still sleep with me. Because if I said no, he wouldn't take me to the hospital. He wouldn't do anything for me. So I just had to accept it. The return home is far from smooth. In Nigeria, their children are often called the Arabo children and stigmatized for the circumstances of their birth. In this protection center, these isolated young mothers are helped by social workers who provide material and psychological assistance. When they come with children that is not wanted, especially children that are being, you know, being brought back, being raped, you know, the identity is not there. It's a lot of trauma for the mothers. We've had cases where the mothers are very aggressive to these children. Joy and Faith may have managed to escape their captors in Libya. But the majority of migrants are too scared to return to their families with a new mouth to feed. The United Nations estimates that some 60,000 Nigerian migrants are still in Libya. Let's go, baby. And finally, inspired by teen environmentalist Greta Thunberg, a 12-year-old Thai girl has become a national hero after declaring a war on plastic. Meet Lily, who's already managed to convince a Bangkok supermarket chain to stop giving out plastic bags. This area of Bangkok is known as the city's green lung, but it's suffocating under plastic, like much of the country. Lily is just 12, yet she's leading the fight to clean up the city, inspired by young Swedish climate change superstar Greta Thunberg. Greta is really important to me because what she symbolizes, um, she says that um, kids can make a difference. She wants everybody to do something and she got so many people together. Thailand's the world's sixth biggest polluter of the oceans. Every Thai person uses on average eight plastic bags a day. Lily is taking her message to the top. She has let several sit-ins outside the government house 
met with business leaders and she spoke at this UN conference. I'm trying to enforce a lesson onto the Ministry of Education, a lesson uh, about the environment. She and fellow activists also clean up the city's canals. It is hard, but I, I would like to be positive about it because there's always hope we can always fix something. If there's a problem, we fix it. Lily's goal is to ban single-use plastic bags by 2022. Her first victory, managing to convince a supermarket chain in Bangkok not to offer plastic bags one day a week. Great to see. And that's it for now. You can also connect with us via our Facebook page, that being, of course, France24.51%, or do send us a tweet at underscore 51%. So until our next show, bye for now.